Hello there, my fellow golden sons of the Emperor, and welcome to your weekly dose of the Primarch's lore. Like I promised previously, this coverage beginning today is gonna be something a little bit more special. And I'm not saying that just because I broke my own rule and will be covering a second traitor Primarch in a row. I'm saying that because we are going to be covering THE Primarch, so to speak. None other than Horus Lupercal himself. This might surprise you, but compared to a few other Primarchs like Lorgar or Gilliman, there's considerably less lore on Horus Lupercal. Sure, he is the star of the very first three books of the Horus Heresy saga, but the actions in these books are kind of inscribed in Warhammer history already. Also, there is very little stuff on his early days, so for today's episode I also blended in some info about the world of Chthonia itself. Lastly, before I begin, since we are gonna be talking about the Arch Traitor himself in this miniseries, I will also probably cover some wider actions and elements of the war which might not be directly about Horus. But as far as that goes, I'll just have to work and see. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us learn a few things about the early days of Horus and his homeworld, shall we? Horus Lupercal, also known simply as the Lupercal, was one of the 20 genetically engineered space marine primarchs created by the Emperor of Mankind from the foundation of his own DNA. Horus was the Primarch of the Luna Wolves Legion of Space Marines, which would later be renamed into the Sons of Horus. He was the first Imperial War Master and the most favored son of the Emperor, and, ultimately and tragically, the greatest traitor in the history of humanity. Created as a genetically engineered organism by the Emperor in the Imperial Gene Laboratories beneath the Himalayan Mountains on Terra, in the late 30th millennium, Horus, along with his brother Primarchs, were scattered across the galaxy through the warp by the machinations of the Dark Gods. This is said to be when the ruinous powers first planted the seeds of heresy into the infant Primarch, whispering darkly into his soul and tempting him to their cause. The capsule carrying the infant Horus came to rest on the mining world of Chthonia, the primary planet of a star system within a reasonable slower-than-light distance of Terra. The world of Chthonia existed in one of Terra's closest neighboring star systems. Being within reach of even non-warp-capable spacecraft, Chthonia had been colonized, built upon, tunneled and mined, probably since the dawn of human interstellar space travel, even before the age of technology had begun. As such, all of the world's natural resources had been stripped away and used millennia before, and the planet's ancient mining technology had long since been rediscovered and removed by the tech priests of Mars. The planet that remained was largely redundant and abandoned, completely riddled with catacombs, crumbling industrial plants, and exhausted mine works. Nobody now knows who were the masters of this hell world before it was rediscovered by the Imperial forces during the Great Crusade. Some Imperial scholars speculate that it was the priesthood of Mars, ever greedy for raw materials to feed their own forge cities. Other sources indicate that it was a star kingdom that dwindled to nothing long before unity was even a dream on Terra. No matter who had once controlled this world, they ate the heart of Chthonia until it was a dead husk. Afterwards, before even the Age of Strife probably, Chthonia had become an orphan world, abandoned to entropy and violence, and even before the Great Collapse, true darkness had descended there. Faced with complete and total economic and societal collapse, the people of Chthonia had either left if they possessed enough wealth to return to Terra, or had sunk ever deeper into the terrible poverty defined by both its savagery and the desperate struggle for survival. Fierce, lawless gangs inhabited the depths of Chthonia, 
enjoying freedom from the rigors of imperial citizenship. There was no law but the blade, no desire apart from that to survive. Some of the gangs were territorial, their leaders possessing all the pretensions of barbarian kings. With armies of men and women bonded to their service, they would seize access to tunnels, demand tribute from other factions, and create enclaves in the lightless heart of abandoned tunnels. To other gangs, blood and power was a crop to be harvested by violence and violence alone, and the dead meat enough to live on. Holding no territory and living just from plunder, these gangs raided, murdered, and burned. Where they didn't find food, ammunition, or supplies, they would raid simply to enhance the fear that they spread, or purge out the weak and undeserving from their own ranks. While these reaving gangs left blood and ruin at their every passing, others moved like specters on the edge of sight, killing silently and for ends that few could understand. Between these factions, a fluid web of respect, tribute, and rivalry existed. Factions would form, evolve, and dissolve in just a few months. Of those that endured longer, only one thing was certain, that their time too would pass. And so it was for the long years of the Age of Strife. The strong killed the weak, only to be killed themselves as others rose up again and again and again. And somehow this murderous strain of Chthonian humanity not only survived, but thrived by murder and prospered by plunder. And so Chthonia endured for many years. Whereas the early history of many Primarchs is extensively, if unevenly documented, the same cannot be said about Horus Lupercal. Contradiction and omission tarnishes all accounts of Horus's formative years. It is clear that somehow he did rejoin the Emperor, and that also he took command of the 16th Legion very early in the Great Crusade. Beyond these manifest facts, agreement between Imperial sources is decidedly lacking, some even placing Horus on Chthonia as a foundling. Like many of his superhuman brothers, these sources say that the young Primarch thrived in Chthonia's harsh environment learning his first lessons of war and killing from Chthonia's tech barbarian kill gangs. The world of Chthonia had been settled in the very earliest days of mankind's exploration of the stars, its rich natural resources ruthlessly exploited until they were all but played out. Thus, Horus grew to maturity among the anarchic gangers populating the post-industrial nightmare of a world honeycombed with long-extinct mines and dominated by decaying hive cities. Though Horus had not been raised during his formative years on Chthonia, supposedly, uncommonly, for a Primarch, he had not fully matured on the cradle world of his legion. But he did speak the harsh language known as Chthonic fluently. In fact, he spoke it with the particular hard palatal edge and rough vowels of a Western Hemispheric ganger, the commonest and roughest of Chthonia's feral castes. Later on, it always seemed amusing to some of the battle brothers of the 16th Legion to hear Horus's accent. They assumed that he spoke in this manner because it was how the Warmaster had learned the language, from just such a speaker but many would come to doubt this hypothesis later on. Horus never did anything by accident, and there were those who believed that the Warmaster's rough Chthonic accent was a deliberate affectation so that he would seem, to the other Astartes of the 16th, as honest and lowborn as any of them. By the time the Great Crusade began, around 830, Chthonia's mines were long spent, but it did have a resource that the new Imperium needed more than metal or jewels. Hardened fighters and born survivors in their millions. A lean and hungry race of killers with no illusions about the horrors of the universe. Chthonia, relatively close to Terra in the Void, and with whom some minor intermittent contact had been maintained even through the Age of Strife, had its murderous and strife-torn populations marked by the very first expeditionary fleets to leave the Sol system. To fuel the growth of the early Space Marine legions, the Imperium took full advantage of the bounty that Chthonia provided. 
At the time of the first founding, Cafonia helped provide the necessary flesh for the gene rights of Luna to fuel the growth of the Legiones Astartes. One report talks of the so-called Imperial Recruitment Squads harvesting Cathonian gangers in their tens of thousands, and shipping them away, chained together in the holds of prison shuttles, to the gene laboratories of Luna. The majority were impressed as troopers for the Crusade's Imperial Army regiments, but the finest of them were taken for induction into the 16th Legion later named into the Luna Wolves after the first campaign beyond Terra in 798 M30. On Luna, these chosen sons of Cathonia were transformed and reborn as the transhuman Astartes of the 16th. It was more common for the first Space Marine aspirants to be volunteers from Terra, and later, after the rediscovery of the Primarchs, from feral or feudal worlds. However, after the usual hypno-psychological indoctrination process, the Luna Wolves, created from the men of Cathonia, emerged as excellent and ferociously powerful space marines. Within the Imperial Army, the Cathonians developed a very similar reputation which led to the formation of several elite Solar Auxilia cohorts, known collectively as the Cathonian Headhunters. Unfortunately, all of these headhunters would side with the traitors during the Horus heresy. Another source claims that Horus returned to Terra himself. It is said that Horus grew at the Emperor's side, learning from his father even as they took back the Sol system and forged the alliances between the techno-barbarian nations of Terra and with the Mechanicus of Mars. This, in turn, would create the Imperium of Man. Other creditable sources claim that the Emperor found Horus, the first of his lost sons, but neither source specifies where or how this finding occurred. Surrounded in millennia of myth and allegory, the truth of the origins of Horus will likely never be known. As a result, Horus was for many standard years the Emperor's only son, and there was a great affinity between them. The Emperor spent a lot of time with his protégé, teaching and encouraging him. Horus was soon placed in command of the 16th Legion, which had already come to be known as the Luna Wolves. More than 10,000 Astartes created from his own genetic code. With these superhuman warriors to lead, Horus accompanied the Emperor for the first 30 years of the Great Crusade and together they forged the first interstellar expansion of the young Imperium of Man. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about Horus Lupercal and the world of Cathonia for today. I do apologize if this episode ended up being a little bit on the short side, but like I said in the beginning, there is very little lore on the early life of Horus. What are your thoughts on the homeworld of Cathonia? As far as places to grow up on go, I can think of very few worse ones as far as the Primarchs are concerned. Do you have any thoughts on how Horus was actually found? Feel free to write them down in the comments below. Was this video informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for more content. Thank you very much for watching to the end, and I wish you all an awesome day. The Emperor protects.